Tim. I look forward to meeting you live sometime. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. Definitely. Oh, hang on, I want it on there. Why is the sound coming through here? We're now officially live on Facebook, simultaneous. All right. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, I don't know why the sound's not coming through the picture. Is it the sound or is it? Oh, I don't think there's any more. Have you, um, have you got it on that you meet people upon entry? Um, no, we can oh, do yes. that. Hang on. I'll mute all. Well, you can just do a setting mute people upon entry. Yeah, it just means upon entry. Work out a way to do it. With Zara's, um... All right, welcome everyone. We're going to get started. I'm going to hand over to Ricky to introduce and start us up tonight. I first want to briefly thank the people involved in making tonight happen. And I want to say a big thank you to Ilan from the My Medicine Australia team for being in touch with me and the YJP way earlier on this year to discuss how we could collaborate and bring to our audience and our network, the work that My Medicine Australia is doing to um, create that awareness. And finally, despite lockdowns and all we've made it here in October, so thank you for your persistence. Um, and of course, thank you to My Medicine Australia team and the YJP team for doing everything behind the scenes to make tonight happen. I'm gonna hand over to Ricky, who's gonna host tonight. Thanks, Yoss. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, nice to see everyone back on Zoom. Uh, I can see that we have some new faces, so I'll quickly just give you an overview of YJP, what we do. Um, so YJP is an organization that connects young people in the Jewish community through business, educational, and social events. And more recently, we've actually started YJP matchmaking to connect singles in our community. So we create opportunities for young people to further their professional and social networks and become the next generation of leaders in their fields in the Jewish community and beyond. Um, so some of our offerings include ongoing business mentorship workshops like this one throughout the year. And these give people the motivation and education to achieve success in a range of industries. We have social Shabbat dinners, Chagim celebrations and Jewish education. And now we have our matchmaking events. So if you are interested to learn more about us, you can go to yjp.org.au. Information's all there. We're also all across social media. And um, yeah, you can head to Facebook, Instagram to follow what's going on at YJP events and just keep up to date. Um, just a few upcoming events that I did want to highlight now that we've opened up. Um, we're going to be having a kind of social get together in the park, uh, hopefully Sunday, 7th of November. So that's the Sunday after this Sunday. Um, we've also got the next business mentor workshop already uh, locked in. That's Thursday, 25th of November, which is in exactly a month. And the topic is shifting sands, exploring the economy, property markets, and the changing patterns of work and employment in 2022 and beyond. And we've also got a really exciting collaboration that we've recently started with Seacare, who deliver food to people um, experiencing food insecurity and social isolation. Um, and our first Sunday launching this collaboration will be, um, I believe, the Sunday after the Sunday. Yep, the 7th of November. We've already got a few volunteers signed up literally in the first hour of posting about this. So that's amazing. Um, and it's just such a perfect opportunity to give back to the community. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in that, again, head to our website, contact one of us, we'd love to have you on the team. Okay, so tonight we are back with what's going to be a fascinating evening about break with, breakthrough therapies in mental illness. So obviously mental health awareness is so important now more than ever, especially after the year that we've just been through. Um, it's relevant to each and every one of us, if not personally, um, we all know someone who has gone through something and has needed a friend or professional help. So besides for bringing to light mental health awareness and uh, you know this new possible treatment for uh, mental health conditions, psychedelics assisted psychotherapy, um, you can also just get inspired from these speakers who are really pushing the limits in their fields. They are fighting to make this therapy available, even though it's controversial um, and there's so many hoops that they are having to jump through, which they will definitely go through. But it's really, really inspiring to see that, you know, all of us 
like them can achieve amazing things and be leaders within our fields. So tonight, just a quick outline of how this is going to work. We're going to start off with our speakers, who I'll introduce in just a moment, um, introducing themselves to us, talking about their career journeys and what actually got them interested in uh, this field of work. And then they'll talk about Mind Medicine Australia, which is the uh, organisation that uh, they founded and that deals with um, psychedelics, assisted psychotherapy. And at the end, we'll open it up to you guys. We'll have question and answer time and uh, together with me, they and I will moderate your questions and address them, anything you're curious about, about this topic. So without further ado, we'll, we welcome Tanya de Jong, AM, and Dr. Ellie Cutler. If you could just wave at everyone so everyone knows who you are, Tanya and Ellie. So Tanya de Jong is a trailblazing Australian soprano, award-winning social entrepreneur, creative innovation catalyst. She calls herself a spiritual journey woman, storyteller and global speaker. She's one of Australia's most successful female entrepreneurs and innovators developing five businesses and three charities, obviously one of them being Mind Medicine Australia. She speaks and sings around the world as a soloist with her group and they've released 12 albums and she's the founder and executive producer of Future Shaping event series, Creative Innovation Global. And she was named in the 100 Women of Influence, the 100 Australian Most Influential Entrepreneurs, and named as one of the 100 Most Influential People in Psychedelics globally in 2021. She also has a fantastic TED Talk, which I did thoroughly enjoy. It's called How Singing Together Changes the Brain, um, and that sparked international interest. So alongside her, we have Dr. Ellie Kotler, who is a consultant psychiatrist. He holds an academic position at Monash University through the Alfred Psychiatry Research Centre. He's the medical director of Melbourne Private Hospital, which is the first addiction hospital in Australia. And he's overseen the development of a clinical program for addictions focused on trauma, particularly developmental trauma. And this has led to an interest in medicine-assisted trauma therapy. He's the founding member of Melbourne Neuropsychoanalytic Group and welcomes new members. And through his involvement with Monash University, he oversees the addiction rotation for medical students. So Ellie graduated from the first intake of certificate in psychedelic assisted, sorry, psychedelic assisted therapies in June 2021. And he's also been recently appointed as the principal investigator to lead Emiria's upcoming MDMA trial. Definitely a role model for myself uh, as a psychology undergrad. So I'm excited to learn more tonight. Um, and that's it for me. So if you don't mind starting us off, uh, tell us about how you got to where you are today in terms of your career journey and a bit about what drew you into psychedelics assisted psychotherapy. Uh, Tanya, if you don't mind taking us taking it away and then we'll hand it over to Ellie. Sure. Uh, so this is just a really quick, quick little um, story of, um, you know, many, many different lives, um, but it started, I guess, just to, to put it in context today. Um, my grandmother invented the very first foldable umbrella in Vienna in 1929 um, and successfully um, manufactured that in an Austrian factory until 1939 when my grandparents were very, very fortunate to flee Vienna with my mother who was just a few months old at the time to eventually end up via Singapore in Australia um, as interned aliens and to eventually get back out into society and restart their lives. Sadly, the majority of the rest of our family didn't make it. And um, so I, my life has been uh, very interesting. I have um, very diverse parents. My, my father was Dutch and he was also moved around from house to house and the Second World War um, and hidden from, from the Nazi occupation. And um, so I became a singer. Um, well, I studied law, but I also uh, became a singer and still perform all over the place. And I love singing. It really is my passion. And uh, I wish that I could do it a lot more, but the last two years have been pretty, pretty heartbreaking on that front. Um, but I've also been a person that has been, oh, it's just someone's, uh, we might just, has everyone got mute on there? Yeah, I think they do. Um, so I've been a bit of a serial entrepreneur, you know, I've started three charities and six businesses um, over the last 20 years or so. 
My charities have been committed to social inclusion and diversity. Um, my first two charities were The Song Room and Creativity Australia. I've never been into drugs. I always thought drugs were bad. Um, <laughs> I, singing was always my drug of choice, I guess. And um, I had no interest in taking any drugs. Uh, even when my friends would try marijuana, I didn't. Um, but about five and a half years ago, I read um, a blog by Tim Ferriss where he talked about donating $100,000 to Imperial College for research into psilocybin. I had no idea what psilocybin was, uh, but I clicked on the article. It was an article by Michael Pollan in the New Yorker magazine. And it was about a trial at New York University for patients with an end of life uh, terminal diagnosis who are experiencing anxiety and depression. And in that trial, 80% of the patients had gone into remission, which was remarkable. This particular article profiled a Jewish man he had some Holocaust trauma, uh, which he'd probably experienced uh, intergenerationally. And though I've never had any particular specific diagnosis of PTSD, I knew that I could never really watch anything to do with the Holocaust. It did create an enormous trauma for me throughout my life. I couldn't be in the room and I couldn't watch it. And I also have dreams that I could never really place that were related to potentially that era of history. And so when I read uh, this story, I thought to myself, wow, that is just so amazing. You know, this guy had experienced complete remission from any of his anxiety or tra trauma related to the Holocaust. And this is something we must do. So I spoke to my husband, I said, you know, we really should try this. Well, my husband's father had committed suicide when he was 13. We all carry trauma. You know, whether it's our own or our ancestors, we're all carrying it with us. And Ali can talk about that a lot more. And um, so he said, well, you know, I'll leave it to you. And we tried to get into some of the trials for healthy patients, but there weren't any at the time we were going to Europe. So we eventually found a guide in the Netherlands, a therapist guide, and we flew to Holland and we underwent an enormous dose of psilocybin, which blew us into the stratosphere, into multiple dimensions. And life was never the same again. It was the most profound and life-changing experience of our lives. Uh, it reconnected us to ourselves, to one another, uh, to many other people, uh, reconnected us to the planet. I've never even wanted to step on an ant ever since then, let alone eat meat. And um, it really felt this, this incredible sense of being part of everything and everything being part of, of, of me. And um, nothing has felt the same again. 12 months later, we, we undertook another session, which was even a, a higher dose. And we started to really research all of these medicines and therapies. And we met a lot of the researchers from around the world for the next couple of years, I guess, and read everything we could. It was like a real obsession. Like we watched everything, read everything. And we were just like bowled over by what this was. Because my, my husband and I had started four previous charities. So we we're very committed to helping people in need and particularly committed to people who are suffering with mental illness and disadvantage. And um, then it, it came to us really that there was no ecosystem in Australia to make sure that these medicines and therapies could be part of the medical system in Australia. And so three years ago, we launched Mind Medicine Australia. And um, it's been like a roller coaster ever since. I mean, it's been a very fast journey, um, a, lot of, a lot of work. Uh, Peter and I, my husband Peter Hunt and I had really decided we were not going to run any more charities. So for us to actually start a charity shows you just how significant this was to us, that we felt that this was the only way really that a lot of people would be able to get well and out of the mental health system in Australia and lead meaningful and happy lives. So we've really dedicated the last few years of our life, night and day, to this quest. And uh, we've got some amazing people who are, which we'll show you in, briefly in this presentation with us. And Dr. Ali is one of them. I'm not gonna speak any longer now, over to you, Ali. <laughs> I also can't watch Holocaust movies. <laughs> um, yeah. As uh, a lot of the audience as well, I'm sure, you yeah. know, carry a lot of that trauma with me as well. Yeah. Um, 
but I uh, began my life at Yeshiva College actually until grade one. Um, so that's where it all began. Um, thanks, Moshe. Um, I really will be quick. Uh, I, I got into psychiatry after I read Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And I thought, you know, where well, I could get paid to read stuff like this, that's pretty cool. Um, and so that's what I've uh, done with my life. I uh, got connected with Mind Medicine Australia after watching the Israeli documentary uh, Trip of Compassion, which I highly recommend. I don't have any shares in it, but I highly recommend that you watch that documentary if you want to, you know, seeing is believing, if you want to see what these medicines can do for people with trauma. We you know, might I do even do of, it as a screening with, um, with YJP. Yeah, it's, it's really uh, an amazing thing to watch. Um, I do a lot of therapy with people with trauma and I've sat with people for years to get them better, like literally years every week. And I saw, you know, people getting better with the type of therapy I do, you know, in months rather than years. And so I was sold after seeing that Israeli documentary and here I am. And we love having you with us, Ali. Thank you so much. So what we might do now is just show you a very quite, uh, short introductory video and then we're going to take you through a a presentation, which we're going to go fairly fast because we want to leave as much time as we can for Q&A. Um, so by all means, start putting your questions into the chat and we'll try and get through as many of them as we can as well. So Alain, if you could show the short video now, that would be wonderful. ...that over 45% of Australians will experience mental illness in their lifetime. That's nearly half of us. Everything feels flat and feel ashamed. Mental ill health devastates lives and families and costs Australians around $60 billion a year. Research and treatment expenses continue to rise, yet rates of mental illness indicate that we're losing the battle. New approaches are urgently needed to address this immense suffering and cost. Psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy is currently being trialled worldwide and has demonstrated remarkable promise in treating depression, anxiety, addiction and post-traumatic stress disorder, with new trials underway for treatment of dementia and anorexia. The treatment combines a short program of psychotherapy with just a few medicinal doses of psilocybin or MDMA. In the 1950s and 60s, Psychedelic treatments had a major impact in psychiatry and many considered it the next big thing in mental health treatment. But for political reasons, the Nixon administration criminalised the use of psychedelics and effectively stopped all research. That research has finally begun again. With proper clinical support, psychedelic treatments are safe and frequently lead to remission after only a short program and even where current treatments have failed. Here at Mind Medicine Australia, we believe everyone should have access to the best treatments for mental illness. We will seek to establish best practice in regulated psychedelic assisted treatment. Mind Medicine Australia is wholly focused on the clinical application of psychedelic medicines. We're preparing for change by developing therapist training, ethical guidelines, a centre of excellence in psychedelic medicine, educational material and events, and supporting clinical research. We're a small organisation doing big things, and we need your support. Please share this video and visit our website to support us and get involved. Excellent, and now I'm just going to share my screen with everyone. Just a moment. Here we go. Just a minute. Excellent. So here we are with this huge mental health emergency. These figures are pre-COVID. One in five Australian adults with a chronic mental illness, one in eight Australians on antidepressants, including one in four older Australians and children as young as four being prescribed with antidepressants. Just two weeks ago, some research came out which suggested that up to four out of five Australians say that their mental health has severely deteriorated through this pandemic. And we've all seen that as Ricky explained in the introduction. 
So we have a massive crisis. And even pre-COVID, it was expected that one in two of us would experience a mental illness in our lifetime. Now, for some parts of the population, the incidence of mental illness is even more significant. So veterans and first responders in particular experience significantly worse mental illness and addictions than other parts of the community, as do some other professions. So accountants, lawyers, vets even, Farmers have been experiencing an enormous amount of mental illness as well. And of course, this leads to immense suffering and unemployment. It leads to homelessness and of course, very tragically suicide. The cost to the Australian economy, around $220 billion, according to the last Productivity Commission estimates. The elephant in the room is the lack of treatments in mental illness. So. The government talks a lot about new patient access gateways, about training more therapists, about providing more telehealth sessions. But the fact is, if we can't get people well and get to the root cause of their suffering, they're gonna stay in the system and either clog it up so that therapists like Ellie have completely full books and they have no capacity to take on new therapists, sorry, new patients, or people drop out of the system and go down a slippery slope of not getting any support, which is of course, extremely tragic as well. So sadly, there's been no improvement in treatment outcomes for over 50 years. In the case of depression, current treatments only work for about 30 to 35% of sufferers to get them well. That is to experience remission, which means they no longer qualify for the diagnosis of depression. And as many of you will know, the side effects of current antidepressants are extremely significant for a lot of patients. In the case of post-traumatic stress disorder, remission rates are as low as 5%. So the majority of patients are not getting well and more of the same is not gonna solve the problem. So my husband and I set up Mind Medicine Australia, as I said, three years ago to expand the treatment options available to practitioners and their patients through safe and effective psychedelic assisted therapies to cure a range of mental illnesses. And indeed, you know, they're also being trialed now for a range of physical illnesses. At the moment, our focus is on medicinal psilocybin and MDMA because they're the most uh, far advanced in the clinical trials around the world. But we're also interested in a range of other psychedelic medicines, which are also being trialed around the world, like LSD, like ayahuasca, ibogaine, uh, DMT, and others. Now, for us, success means that these therapies become part of our mental health system. So that means if you go to a practitioner and you're suffering with some kind of mental you know, illness, depression, anxiety, trauma, whatever it happens to be, then the doctor will give you a choice of existing you know, pharmacotherapy. So it might be antidepressants, antipsychotics and psychotherapy and also psychedelic assisted therapy as an option with full disclosure on the risks and benefits of all kinds of treatment. The other thing that of course we really aim for is that these treatments continue to achieve the incredibly high remission rates they're achieving. So out of over 160 current and recent trials, the remission rates have been between 60 to 80%. I mean, that's a heck of a lot more people getting well than with the current existing treatments. And of course, our goal is that these medicines are accessible and affordable to all Australians, no matter where they're based or their financial circumstances. So we put together a, an amazing board. We have the former head of the armed forces. We have Ellie, of course, who, who you see here today. We have Simon Longstaff, who's the head of the Ethics Centre. And he says it's unethical for these medicines to be withheld from Australians who are suffering in medically controlled environments. We also have Andrew Robb, who's the former trade minister for Australia, who's been suffering with treatment resistant depression for 43 years. At last count, he was on his 13th antidepressant and has tried many, many different treatments. And he's very angry that he hasn't had access to these treatments yet. We also are growing our team and um, that is um, very exciting. And we're getting some wonderful new people into our team. And if you want to be involved with us, please reach out. We also have lots of volunteering and other opportunities. And we'll talk further about ways you can join this movement. 
We also have here the leading ambassadors. Um, so these are really the leaders in the world. They don't, you know, they really dedicated their lives to this movement, their lives and their careers to making these medicines available. And they're just inspirational people. And then we have lots of psychiatrists and I'm just gonna flip through these really fast. This is all on our website, lots of psychiatrists, GPs, emergency physicians, uh, clinical psychologists, behavioral scientists, researchers and pharmacologists, religious leaders. You can see you know, rabbis and Muslim leaders there and lawyers and natural medicine people, public health experts, anthropologists, defense experts, and so on. So just to show you what we're talking about here and what is so extraordinary about these medicines is that with just two to three medicinal dose sessions with these medicines in combination with a short course of psychotherapy, people are going into complete remission. Now, you compare that against a lifetime sentence for many people of a mental illness with taking a capsule or tablets every day or some other kind of treatment that they have to keep doing for the rest of their life. So these medicines are curative. It's not just a palliative treatment, it's not just managing the condition. The other really remarkable thing about these treatments is they're very safe and they're non-addictive. They've both been granted breakthrough therapy designation by the FDA in the US. And that is a rarely granted designation only given to medicines that could be vastly superior to existing treatments to fast track the approval process. So once the medicine goes through the phase three trials, if it, the phase three trials go well, the medicine becomes instantly prescribable. And MDMA assisted therapy is very much, very close to that stage right now. Now, Ellie's just going to talk to you about a little bit about what happens in a, in a session or if you were a patient wanting to undergo this treatment now. Uh, thanks, Tanya. So one uh, really important thing to think about is this is a new paradigm for mental health treatment. This is not more of the same. It's not another antidepressant or another antipsychotic or another uh, psychotherapy with, you know, three-letter acronym. This is a really new uh, paradigm for mental health treatment. And just to explain this briefly, it, it's really, it's, it's, it's basically psychotherapy on steroids is one way to think about it. It is, it's, even though you're taking a medication, it's the therapeutic process which helps the person. It's not the, the, it's not the medication per se. So it's not like taking an antidepressant and you go home and you take it for, for months and for years. You take the um, medication two, three or four times, perhaps a month apart, and before and in between and after uh, all the, the, med the medical sessions, there's psychotherapy. And the psychotherapy basically, first of all, prepares you with what you're going in with. Uh, people, have a, people can have a sense of what, they, what their issues are and what they want to resolve. Perhaps they've got a trauma, perhaps they've got an issues, issue with their mum, perhaps they've um, got transgenerational, you know, Holocaust trauma. And so you can, the idea is to first understand what I'm going in with. The medicine then allows you to really, as we'll talk about a little bit more soon, it really allows you to um, confront yourself. It allows you to enter the parts of your psyche that are usually blocked off and defended against because they're too painful, they're too overwhelming, they're too scary. Maybe they've even been repressed for 20 years. You may not even know that they're there. But these medicines seem to allow us to open up to ourselves um, and experience these parts of ourselves whilst feeling safe enough to do so. And then the sessions after the medicine sessions are really about integration. So the integrative sessions, and they help you integrate what's come up for you um, in, in, in the hope that you can learn to live with all the parts of yourself particularly the parts of yourself that have been too traumatic to, to sit with and maybe causing, you know, what we call chronic mental illnesses like depression, anxiety or PTSD. You know, these often arise because we can't sit fully with ourselves and we have to escape ourselves. And so these, medic these medicines really allow us to sit fully with all the different parts of our psyches which, which have been cut off due to trauma and other difficult emotional experiences. Tanya mentioned... Um, so, so that's just to reinforce, that's a new paradigm. That's not, that's not something, you know, that's not more of the same. Um, Tanya mentioned psilocybin and MDMA. 
they're, they're the ones that have been studied. They're not even necessarily the most powerful psychedelics for mental illness. LSD was studied a lot in the 50s and 60s, um, but because it's um, got some baggage, you know, they decided not to go with LSD. So at the moment, the ones, the, the compounds that are most um, readily studied are psilocybin and MDMA. Uh, next slide, please. No, thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention one thing, Ellie, and you might talk to this as well, just before we move on, because I think this is a really important slide. Um, you know, for many patients, they describe these experiences as one of the top five most meaningful experiences in their lives. In fact, many patients describe the experience as the most e meaningful experience in their life. Now, whoever says that about a medicine? And um, so Ali, you might wanna just talk about the difference there between psilocybin and MDMA just very briefly as well in terms of the medicine yep. makeup. So psilocybin is a classic psychedelic. Um, it's from a, a f fungi, fungi, fungi. <laughs> it's a classic psychedelic which has been used for thousands of years. MDMA is a synthetic compound which was um, produced in 1912. Um, the classic psychedelics, they, they have slightly different, um, they have different experiences for people that take them. They both can be very healing. Um, the experience can be different, um, though there is some similarities. With classic psychedelics like psilocybin, people, um, it's much more common to have spiritual experiences or spiritual awakenings. Um, it, it's, um, it's more common to have an ego dissolution, you know, like in, in Judaism, we talk about bitul, yeah, like bitul hayesh, um, you know, the, the breaking down of the, of the ego, of the yetzahara, you know, whatever you want to call that part of the mind. And, and these medicines, um, the classic psychedelics really allow the ego to melt away. And when the ego melts away, we can face different parts of ourselves. We can be much more connected with other people and the world. Um, and they can give a real sense of unity, uh, the, uh, uh, an experience of unity, both with the self and other people and the world, which is what we get when we break down our own craziness, you know, and, and our own um, egos. MDMA is, is not as psychedelic, first of all, in the sense of it may not be so visual, um, but, not everyone describes a spiritual experience with MDMA, but MDMA has a lot of unique properties. It's almost the perfect medicine for therapy. It's triggering. It releases things like dopamine and noradrenaline. It's quite triggering. Uh, but at the same time, it also triggers things like oxytocin, which uh, is a, a hormone and a neurotransmitter that's particularly associated with uh, parental and infant bonding. So if you take the oxytocin levels of parents whilst they're engaged with their infants in bonding behaviours, their oxytocin levels are higher. If you give parents oxytocin, um, it leads to more bonding behaviours. And so it's a, it's a hormone and neurotransmitter that seems to be associated with safety, like a feeling that, you know, mummy's hugging me and everything's okay. So it's got this um, amazing uh, dual action of allowing people to feel heightened um, and go into their trauma and sort of feel the intensity of the trauma, but at the same time feel really safe to do so. Um, and safety, you know, safety is associated with, um, with trust, you know, which is a munah and bitachon, those things that really uh, form the foundation of our human experience and our ability to, uh, you know, connect to ourselves and other people. Thank you, Ellie. That's fantastic. And here you can see the, the, the safety record. So, you know, there's been thousands of patients that have gone through trials in this renaissance that has taken place in the last decade or so. And there's been no adverse events whatsoever. And you can see a patient, they're undergoing the treatment. So they've got an eye mask on, they've got headphones on because they're hearing a beautifully curated playlist that is time for the different stages of the experience. And there's two therapists who are supporting them, holding the space and helping them with their journey. I mean, in the case of psilocybin, they'll mostly be in a completely altered state, but in the case of MDMA, as Ellie explained, they'll be more um, 
more present in the, in this dimension, but uh, still in an altered and extremely beautiful state. You can see here also a, a relative drug harm study that was done in 2019 at the University of Melbourne that shows just how safe psilocybin and MDMA are, even in recreational environments. And of course, the most dangerous drug to self and others is alcohol. So this is all around the wrong way. <laughs> and if anything should be banned, then it should be the ones at the other end of the scale, not psilocybin and MDMA. But anyway, we are where we are. So one of the really remarkable things um, about this work is that you see these incredible testimonials. And we've just released Australia's very first book of psychedelic healing stories. And you can see just some of the quotes that people say about their experience. You know, I felt like I went through 15 years of psychological therapy in one night. And if you have a look at our book of healing stories, and I'll ask Ilan if he can put a link to that in the chat, you'll hear, like, you'll be able to read 53 stories of Australians who've, like, completely healed from a range of, in some cases, incredibly complex trauma and mental illness through these treatments. Unfortunately, on the reverse side of this slide, we also get about 15 to 20 calls, emails, uh, text messages a day from people who are desperately in need of these treatments. They've tried everything that you can imagine and multiple electric shock treatments, EMDR, a range of different therapies, multiple antidepressants, antipsychotics and other things. And really for many people, this is their last hope. So we all need to work together really hard to make sure that we can actually support the innovation in treatment that is so desperately needed in our communities and our families. So the normal effect size for an antidepressant on the Cohen's D scale is about 0.3. And you can see there psilocybin for depression 2.0 to 3.1 and also MDMA there. You see these, these results are really off the charts. And we also have... Um, this this wonderful slide and I'll speak to it briefly and then Ali might want to add some things to it as well but effectively what's happening here is that these medicines alter the communication between different brain networks and bypass what's called the default mode network of our brain the default mode network of our brain keeps us defaulting to fairly rigid and stuck styles of thinking most of which have originated in childhood and you can see there on the right, the placebo, you can see that there's a fairly stuck brain. You know, the neural networks are not really connecting that well. And then you see the ingestion with the psilocybin. So you can see this massive neuro neurogenesis, this increased neural plasticity, this increased connectivity between different brain hemispheres. And interestingly enough, there's the same amount of lines in both of these drawings. It's just that one, is a brain that's really functioning and the other one is stuck. And it's from this really functioning brain that you get this window of opportunity occurring where skilled therapists like Ellie can work with a patient because the medicine has opened that patient up to be able to break out of their repetitive styles of thinking and to start to become active agents for their own healing. Many researchers and doctors who work in this space describe this as resetting or rebooting the brain or defragging the dodgy hard drive. But Ellie might want to add to, to this as well. Do you want to say anything else about this slide, Ellie? I will just add that it speaks to the, to, to use a reasonably fancy word, transdiagnostic um, aspects to these medicines. Transdiagnostic in the sense that these medicines don't necessarily care what diagnosis you have. So it's not like there's an, you know, an antidepressant for, for depression. There's an antipsychotic for psychosis. These medicines work on the underlying aspects of our experience that tend to fuel mental illnesses. You now, all mental illnesses can, in one sense, be understood as stuck ways of thinking, feeling, and behaving. Someone with depression might hate themselves. Someone with an eating disorder can't, you know, has particular patterns of, of behavior. And this slide speaks to the, you know, part of the mode of action of these medicines, which is really to reset um, the 
stuck ways that our brains tend to be wired, no, no matter what the actual diagnosis is on the surface. And the other really remarkable thing about these treatments is that you get increasing remission. So, you know, for those of you that, that you know, know people with um, who've been taking like antidepressants, for example, or if you've taken them yourself, you'll know that you might get an initial uplift, but then things will plateau and then they might drop away. And then the doctor will say, oh, we have to double your dose or we have to try a different medicine. Whereas with these medicines, what you're seeing is these increasing remissions. And in that New York University study that I mentioned at the start, that was really the inspiration for me in these medicines, they actually went back to that group of patients four and a half years after the original study. Not only were all of these patients nearly all still alive, um, but all of them were still in remission, which is pretty remarkable. So MDMA, as Ali has mentioned, it's not ecstasy. This is not party drugs. This is pure GMP grade MDMA, not adulterated with other substances. And it decreases the activity of the amygdala, which is what is responsible for our fight or flight response, which often means that when we're asked to talk about a trauma, that it might re-trigger or re-traumatize us. Whereas MDMA creates this great sense of love and trust and warmth and safety where someone can talk about their trauma without being re-triggered and that they can accept it. It doesn't mean they forget it, but that they can move forwards with their lives. And in the MAPS phase two trials, there were 105 patients, each had an average of PTSD for 18 years. So you can imagine their suffering. 52% of them went into remission immediately after the three doses with a short course of psychotherapy and 68% at the 12 month follow-up really remarkable results. And that led to the current phase three trials. And we'll come back to those in a moment. So what we're seeing now is this incredible momentum growing around the world. We're seeing these medicines being used and trialed for a whole range of conditions, obsessive compulsive disorder, eating disorders, like Ellie mentioned, a whole range of addictions, Parkinson's, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's, dementia, weight loss, fibromyalgia, you name it. We're also seeing um, regulatory schemes, including in Australia, which are called special access schemes. They're like compassionate access schemes. There's one in Israel as well and, and in the US and so on. And these schemes are where a doctor like Ali, a psychiatrist or other physician, can work with a treatment resistant patient to get a special approval to treat a patient where other treatments have failed and where the patient's in danger. And Ellie, for example, has got an approval in uh, Victoria to treat a patient with MDMA-assisted therapy. So he got that federally, but unfortunately our state system is preventing the medicines from being brought into Victoria to treat his patient, which is really unfortunate. And we're working really hard to ensure that the medicines are rescheduled from Schedule 9, prohibited medicine, to Schedule 8, controlled medicine. So you'll never get to take the medicines home in the first instance of this, but um, at least people could start to be treated case by case. And of course, it's very likely that MDMA will soon become a prescribable medicine and that psilocybin will soon follow. We also work with Canberra to get $15 million um, of funding towards further research and development. And there should be an announcement on that fairly soon. And that's was applied for by various university researchers. And we're also seeing states in the US like Oregon starting to legalize psilocybin for therapeutic use. Now these trial results are really interesting. These are the most significant trials that just got announced in the last couple of weeks, uh, couple of months. The Imperial, Imperial College trial results in the New England Journal, one of the most prestigious medicine journals in the world. It directly compared two doses of psilocybin with a daily dose of a leading antidepressant, escitalopram, and both groups of patients had a short course of psychotherapy. At the end of that six weeks, twice as many people in the psilocybin group had gone into remission as the antidepressant group, 
and there are way less side effects, less suicidal ideation and so on. So that was an incredible trial. But even more significant is the MAPS phase three trial part one, where 67% of participants after just three MDMA sessions no longer qualified for a diagnosis of PTSD and 88% experienced clinically meaningful reductions in symptoms. It's expected that with further integration, that could go up to 80% remissions. Pretty amazing. And now all these universities around the world, like Yale, Harvard, Oxford, you name it, are all studying these substances with leading research and development programs around the world. And we're also seeing like incredible centers of excellence emerging all over the world. We're looking to set one up in Australia as well in partnership with some unis. So I think all of us probably know that these medicines have been around since ancient times. Like you can see them in the ancient Greek and Roman archeology. span They've also been around in indigenous cultures right since the beginning, including in the Aboriginal indigenous culture in Australia. And many of you may have heard of acacia bush, which is a psychoactive DMT containing plant. And, you know, it could very well be the case that the song lines and those wonderful dot paintings that you see of Indigenous people in Australia are created by people who are in these sorts of altered states, non-ordinary states. As Ali said, and as the video said at the start, you know, over 40,000 patients took part in therapeutic psychedelic sessions in medically controlled environments in the 50s and 60s. These were considered the next big thing. And Stan Groff there, who's one of the leading psychiatrists, also Jewish, said psychedelics would be for psychiatry what the microscope is for biology and medicine or the telescope is for astronomy. That's how significant these treatments are. But what happened in 1970 was that President Nixon criminalized the use of these treatments, not for any scientific reason. This was entirely political, but sadly it meant that these um, substances basically were no longer trialed, they were no longer used, they were no longer researched for like the best part of 35 years, which is a terrible travesty on the human race because in that period, we've seen this huge spike in loneliness, in social isolation, and in a range of mental illnesses. David Nutt, who's one of our ambassadors, describes it as the worst censorship of research and medical treatment in the history of humanity. You can see what happened there. So there we were. It was like an incredible burgeoning field. Then nothing pretty much happened for a while. And now we're sort of back just above where we were back in 1970. And you can see, all of these trials emerging around the world. Also, what we're seeing is an amazing amount of for-profit companies emerging around the world, because you know people see this as a trillion dollar market opportunity. And there's probably not a week that goes by since we started Mind Medicine Australia, where we're not seeing for-profit companies emerging. We're looking at reinventing the molecules, manufacturing the medicines, rolling out clinics and so on. So, We've just got a couple of slides left before we go into some Q&A, but really our goal at Mind Medicine Australia is to build the ecosystem. So we do that through events like these. So if any of you are on here and you would want to perhaps do an information session for your organisation or your community, please reach out. We run a free global webinar series. We have a major international medical summit in three weeks with some of the leading researchers in the world. We have over 30 chapters around Australia and New Zealand where people can learn more. They can build grassroots communities and run events around Australia and, and you know, just really help get people, I guess, educated about the data and science and remove the stigma and prejudice that has been associated with these medicines for too long. As Ellie mentioned, or as I think Ricky mentioned, Ellie was one of the first graduates of our Professional Development Certificate in Psychedelic Assisted Therapies, which is the very first course of its kind in the Southern Hemisphere, four month part time course for psychotherapists, psychologists, GPs, psycho, um, psychiatrists, uh, nurses, paramedics, social workers, occupational therapists, and other health professionals. And it's an incredible world class faculty. We're also looking at setting up the first Asia Pacific Center in Mental Health. Uh, for emerging mental health therapies in partnership with some universities. And we have a lot of other professional development programs as well. And we're of course working with the, the regulators um, 
to set up the legal and ethical frameworks and so on. So just, ah, here we are. Oops, just go back. Um, so Tim Ferriss, who was the original guy who sparked my interest in this with his blog, said, you know, he views the next five years as a golden window in which small amounts of money can basically affect millions of lives. And all of us can really make a difference in this space. And lots and lots of people always say to us, how can we help? How can we be part of this? So there's lots and lots of different ways. You know, you can volunteer, you can join your chapters, you can start chapters, you can, we have an amazing learn section on our website. Just talking to your GPs and doctors makes a big difference. I often speak to different GPs that I might go to and I find it surprising how few of them know what psychedelic assisted therapy is. But once I tell them, they're usually pretty curious and then they start registering for our events, our trainings and so on. Of course, we'd love you to support us in any way you can. I mean, we're a charity and my husband and I are philanthropists but we can't do this alone. So please, if you, if you can um, support us and I promise you and guarantee you that we will make this happen. And um, you can name us your charity of choice or whatever. You can also talk to your local MPs and attend our events. We run a lot of free events too. And um, I'm just gonna scoot through here. This is a certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies for those who are therapists. This is a four-part online course that we, we have periodically. It's wonderful. We also get a lot of people who use these medicines underground and they can get support through psychologists and psychotherapists before and after the medicine experience. So though we can't have therapists sit with you during your medicine experience because it's illegal, this is a harm reduction service to help people who are using these medicines because the longer it takes for these medicines to become available above ground the more people go underground to seek out assistance. This is the rescheduling that uh, just got announced by the TGA and this is who's presenting at our incredible summit in three weeks. This is some of the leaders in the field. Many of you will know of them. We also have Gabor Mate there just incredible people. So we really hope that um, some of you will want to come. We're thrilled to offer you a special um, code, MMA2021. Uh, this is for YJP. If any of you want to come, we'll give you uh, that special discount. And we have more events coming up in the future. I'm going to stop the share now. I think we can open the gallery and we can start to answer your questions. And we have lots of questions here. So let's have a look. Ali, do you have any that you instantly want to answer? And by the way, if you want to put up your hand as well, we're more than happy if you want to unmute a mic, uh, you can speak. We love hearing people's voices. <laughs> so there's not just a one way uh, communication. So if you want to actually put up your hand and ask a question, we'd love to hear your voice as well. Tanya, if you don't mind, I'll just um, just highlight an earlier question that came in um, that I'll give over to Yossi actually, just for a quick minute. Someone asked if LSD and other psychedelics are allowable in halachic Judaism, which uh, wasn't the intended topic for tonight, but I think we'll just quickly address it. Sure, sure. neither was I a presenter tonight, but um, like everything, like all social issues, what happens in the world eventually gets reflected in the literature of um, secular law and religious law. So just like this is currently being developed in Australian law, I'm sure there'll be response in the halachic world of how to understand these medicines and how they're used in, especially for therapy, to adapt to these new therapies. So stay tuned. <laughs> Actually, okay. also... Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, I just think it, it, I think it's a it's an even more interesting question for um, you know religious Jews or you know and people of other religions because I think it also raises a fascinating question. Well, what are these realms that people enter when they're on psychedelics? You know, are these the other worlds described by Kabbalists? Are they not? You know, what do they have any connection to those things? So I think yeah. um, 
you know, it's there are halakhic aspects, but there's also philosophical, you know, fascinating philosophical aspects. Absolutely. And when I read that book uh, by Michael Pollan, I, I was definitely a bit thrown because it seems almost like people's experience under the influence of psilocybin or whatever it is, is almost influenced by their religious background or upbringing. Um, so, yeah, definitely, definitely interesting. Um, there's a, a question from Binny and Honey. Do you guys want to speak up? Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? <clears throat> uh, yeah, we can hear you. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks for a great session, as always. I'm just wondering, is, is are there any like are there any increased risks for some for these kinds of psychedelic treatments for somebody who may be in recovery for an, for an addiction? Uh, no, not that we know of. Um, the studies suggest so both theoretically and from the studies, the short answer is no. These experiences are not addictive whatsoever. The experiences are, they can be beautiful. They can also be, um, uh, well, profound is probably a good word for the experiences because they can bring up a lot of very difficult um, parts of people's experiences, of people's uh, psyches. You know, it can bring up people's fears. People have to walk through their fears. So they can, there, it's it leads to profound experiences, but the the experiences can be really exhausting. People can do a lot of psychological work, a lot of emotional emotional work work in short periods of time. So the experiences are actually not addictive whatsoever. Um, no one wants to, you know, you have a psychedelic, you, you work through some trauma, you're not running back there. You know, it may be profoundly um, healing for you, but you're not running back for another another shot. Exactly. It took me a year to, to, you know, really build up to have a second treatment. So that proves that point very strongly. There's a question yeah, here. Sorry. So what happens if you if they're going into the treatment without an intention, if they if they don't believe they've got a problem? How does it work if if, if someone was in that in that condition if they didn't think they had a problem but they're happy to do the session if they don't go in with the right intention I mean does does it make does it still work or is it worth it or do they really have to be honest before they go in it and face their problems or can they just give it a whirl and see what happens I mean that's what I'd like to know what's your view on that uh, I mean we're you know we're, we're here discussing I guess the therapeutic aspects of yeah. Uh, psychedelics, um, yeah. recreational aspects, I guess, uh, are different. Um, but in, uh, a psychological, in a different area, in a, in a clinical um, environment, so so they're going in to to get the help, but they still don't believe they've got a problem before they go in. Do they need to have the intention of understanding their problem before they go in? You know how many addicts don't believe they're addicts. Do you know what I mean? Um, uh, yeah, no, I, th I mean, certainly things can come up even if you don't have the intention. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, often unconscious things come up. So, you yeah. know, by definition. I mean, usually, definition. you know, in terms of like what sort of intention that I might set, um, I've often set is, you know, please let me see whatever I need to see. Let me heal whatever I need to yeah. heal. So, yeah. and then by leaving it quite open, then what? The medicine will give you what you need, not what you want, yeah. right? Um, just in regards to like my brother who who has an addiction, but he doesn't believe he's got an addiction, but he has, but and he wants to do this, wants to do it, but I thought you would have had to have gone in with the, the right intention to want, want the help or what have you. If he goes in, you know, thinking, oh, yeah, it's all, I mean, I'm just, Will it, will it be beneficial? And if then if he doesn't decide to do integration afterwards, is it a waste? I mean, I mean, I just would have thought you had to be a bit committed to it, to to wanting to to heal before you entered the did the session. I was just hmm. I think you would definitely have to be committed to it to yeah. do it to begin with. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, it's to... not something you want to push on to someone or suggest to someone if they don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. But if they want to do it, but they still think there's nothing wrong, uh, and that you know they yeah, why they, would want, they to want to do it. Oh well, <laughs> I don't know. Well, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why he wants to do it. He wants to do it with me, probably maybe to deal with past stuff. But 
I don't know. I don't. Yeah, I don't so know we're, we're really not, dis you know, we're, we're okay. discussing, yep. I guess. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. For, uh, you know, I guess we're, we're sticking to um, medically prescribed um, psychedelics. Yeah, well, yeah. yes. But he Thank wouldn't be Anna. able to get into, I'll a, just... into a... Thanks, Anna. Sorry. I'll just highlight another question that came up in the chat. Um, Lily wanted to know if you could explain what a medically controlled environment was. So you were saying that, you know, we prescribe these medications in a medically controlled environment. What does that look like? What does that mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, so we, we showed you a photo, yeah, of what a medically controlled environment could look like. And quite often, and Ellie will, I'm sure, chime into this as well, but usually it's some kind of a clinical environment, but that has been made to look much more warm and friendly than a normal, you know, normal clinical environment. Um, and of course, you know, set and setting is critical for the effect of these treatments to be effective. By set, that means mindset. So this refers slightly to what Anna was talking about. So, you know, you actually do have to be in the right mindset and be set up for that correctly. And then of course, setting refers to that clinical environment, that it's comfortable, that it's safe, that it's warm, that it's soundproof, because you might, you know, you might make some noise. Ellie, do you want to add into that at all? Yeah, yeah, just just to say that it's really, um, it, it's it's not a medicalized environment, it's medically safe, um, but it's not yeah. medicalized. So, you know, people are encouraged to bring in, you know, important objects they might have, listen to music that they may connect with, um, it's not a cold medical room, you know. So, so it's medicalized in the sense that there are some safety equipment available. Um, currently in the studies, they're still checking blood pressure every few hours, things like that. That's the idea of, a, of the medical environment. It's not medicalized, it's medical in the sense just to ensure safety. They are very safe compounds, but at the moment in the research stage, <laughs> There have to be safety, you know, there has to be safety equipment available, basically. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm an integrative general practitioner. So that's why I was just asking how it wasn't really to do with set and setting was my question it was more to do with the practicalities of how long are you sitting with a patient oh. for? That's where I was coming from. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so usually, you know, that's around. In the case of psilocybin, about four to six hours. Yeah, I mean, it's around four to six hours for both of the medicines, but then obviously, you know, people are coming in. And and so that's why in terms of our CPAT course, there's people like Ellie who might be a prescribing doctor, but they wouldn't necessarily sit with the patient for the whole six to eight hours. That would probably be more likely to be done by a psychologist, psychotherapist, counsellor, um, even a social worker, you know, who's been trained. So the actual prescribing doctor may not be the one sitting with the patient because that may blow out the cost and you know and Ellie might have to see another eight or so patients that day would you just would you agree with that Ellie um yeah I mean uh, <laughs> yes I mean as a as a as a GP I mean I think it's great because you would have the option of doing either you could potentially exactly. as it comes through you could be the prescriber or you could be the prescriber and the therapist Exactly. Um, but it's an all day. It's all day. It's an all it's an all day event. Yes. And that's sorry. sorry, that's what I would have thought that it would have been. So it's, that's why I was trying to work it out. How how could that be if you're the one that's sitting there with the patient? Obviously, you know, you can't uh, you love to do that. But how would that work practically? I don't think it would. You'd have to be but you'd still have to be in the same environment. Like you're mentioning blood pressure and things like this. You'd have to be in the same area the same clinic yeah not to sound too ridiculous about it but you know there are a lot of medical specialties where you can have you know six seven patients um you know in rooms and the doctor sort of goes from room to room um i mean in this therapy the person always has two therapists with them generally a male and a female but the prescribing doctor doesn't necessarily have you know is not there um yeah. necessarily in right. fact, they're often not there, Lily, though, of course, it would be wonderful to be there, you know, when you first originally did do it. And, and you know, I'm sure Ellie would want to sit with some patients as well um, to do this. But eventually, of course, that's why we're training such a diverse array of health professionals so they can actually be the sitters in a way. Yeah. Um, 
So there's but, prescribers and then there's actual citizen support team, if that makes sense. Sure, absolutely. Thank you for answering that. No, that's a pleasure. And, you know, look, we'd love you to do the CPAC course if you're... Um, I was looking into it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Thanks, Lily. Um, we've got the next question. What would be the advantage of this kind of therapy over EMDR, so, uh, which is eye movement desensitization reprocessing, I believe, which is where you process traumas uh, with a therapist by moving your eyes back and forth. And it's also another emerging area um, in psychotherapy. So how would you compare them or is one more effective? Have they been compared yet? I mean, the short answer would be that at this stage, psychedelic assisted therapy looks much more efficacious um, than really any other therapy. I mean, the, it, Tanya mentioned the elephant in the room um, and many people may, may not appreciate the elephant in the room, um, but most treatments we have for mental health, if you really look into the data, as I have a lot in addiction, but also somewhat um, in other areas of mental health, our treatments are not very effective. Um, and EMDR, um, you know, is also not that, you know, it's, it's, it's not a, it, it, it doesn't have the effect sizes that psychedelics appear to have. Um, not that it's, you know, it's a very good treatment. There's a lot of good treatments around, but they tend to not be particularly, they don't have particularly large effect sizes in terms of actually getting people better. Um, that would be my short answer. There's also um, a question here about would one need to be free of any prescription drugs before starting the treatment? And yes, it's imperative to taper off. Ellie can talk about that um, briefly. Do you want to talk about that briefly, Ellie? Because otherwise the receptors are not going to, you know, if you take these medicines when you're on full doses of antidepressants, basically the receptors are going to be blocked. So you're not going to actually experience the ego dissolution and all the benefits of these treatments. Yeah, and it's going to be a tricky, it's going to be a little bit of a tricky um, issue clinically um, because the trials do suggest that you need to be off uh, medications, um, particularly the very common ones like SSRIs, SNRIs, Seroquel, these types of medications that, you know, um, and so there, yeah, there has to be a lot of um, thought put into that. And it's an important clinical point that it seems like you have to be off medications. And then, and for the trials that have taken place so far, they've worked very closely with the patients prescribing doctor to taper off very safely so that the patient, you know, is safe um, throughout the lead up. And usually they only say two to three weeks is necessary, actually. So that's interesting. Um, it looks like Binny and Khani have had their hands up for a bit. Um, did you have another question, Binny? Yeah, hi, thanks. I'm um, just wondering, Amir, excuse me if I missed this. Has there been research into these kind of therapies um, and how they can help sleeping disorders? Huh. Um, no, it's really interesting. I mean, like, you, do you mean like insomnia or sleep apnea or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sort of thing. Wow, yeah, it's really interesting. I actually have insomnia <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I can't say that these treatments have really helped me that much with insomnia. Um, in fact, what I found most helpful for that has actually been CBD and um, THC prescribed by my, my general practitioner. Um, so I don't know, but I mean, you know, I haven't, mm. I don't know. I haven't seen anything like... in sleep disorders. So what? was that? I haven't seen anything in sleep disorders. There's I'm a lot yet. of research going on, autistic spectrum disorders, eating disorders, addictions. I haven't seen anything in sleeping uh, okay. disorders. Interesting. Um, there's also a question here from Dan who says, um, some kind of proper, oh, and other, oh, okay. So that's, I think your question, Dan, is about psych support services. So that's a harm reduction service. Um, so if you are planning on using these medicines, we don't recommend people do this. We're not allowed to because it's illegal, but we accept that lots of people are going to go and use these medicines because they've tried everything else. And so 
if you are doing that, it's best to get support before and after so that you can make the most of those experiences, in, which is why we have psych support services. And Ilan will put the link for that into the chat. Um, there's a question here also, Yosef. And indeed, psilocybin is taken uh, recreationally in microdoses, uh, as is LSD um, in many places. In fact, in Silicon Valley, famously, <laughs> People say that any entrepreneurs and businesses who are not microdosing with psilocybin or LSD are not going to succeed against their competitors. Um, and I can certainly attest to the fact that psilocybin is extremely beneficial to both creativity, productivity, and clarity of thinking. Um, yeah, I'll say that. And look in the future, like in the Netherlands, Let's talk about the Netherlands. So I, I was born in Holland and um, in the Netherlands, like every third or fourth shop sells psilocybin truffles, literally, and a whole range of other interesting <laughs> medicines. And people, of course, do microdose legally there. They have legal psilocybin sessions and so on. But Australia is where it is and that's what we're trying to, to break through. But in the future, we believe once you know these medicines become available through the medical system that there will be a time hopefully not too far away where they can be used for other purposes to enhance consciousness and healing and one of the things we know for example is from a religious perspective is that there's actually ayahuasca churches in many places um, where particular religions actually use ayahuasca as, as part of their religious practice so um, these are very much part of some people's religious um, practice, regular practice. Um, we can't, to the RAP family, give you a, a therapist. I'm sorry, that's something that we just can't do because we'd be breaking the law. Um, and in terms of Sophia, yes, Sophia, if you just write to me, um, I can definitely refer you to my CBD prescriber um, that's that's absolutely fine there's some very good GPs that um, prescribe CBD and THC as well in fact who knows Lily might Lily do you prescribe medicinal cannabis is Lily still there I don't know Lily's uh, yes I am sorry I just had to unmute no, no. I don't at this stage okay. um, yeah. yeah not at this stage Thanks. I have another question, just yes. as an aside, with the CPAC yes. course, I understand, you know, there's two courses next year, but um, what happens with Melbourne in terms of, like, I'm in New South Wales, and sorry to bring it up, but with regards to the borders and crossing over borders, vaccination, unvaccination, mm. would there be any yeah. choice of doing the courses anywhere other than Victoria? Yeah, we are actually looking at doing an intake in New South Wales next year. Um, so if you put that as a preference in your, um, when you when you put your application in, that's something we could definitely look at accommodating. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you so much. And we'd love you to spread the word to other colleagues of yours in New South Wales. Absolutely. I saw Avni and Ian Brighthope up there on your uh, on your board. So yes. Yes. So, very old friends of mine. Oh, they're wonderful. I love Avni and Ian. Fantastic. Absolutely. <laughs> now, I've got um, a question here from Sophia, yeah. which is, is one guided when in an altered state? Um, and I guess that's about what happens in the actual session. Um, so as we mentioned before, the classic psychedelics like psilocybin are potentially a little bit different than MDMA. In general, if there is any, in, in general, there's no guidance from the from the sitters or the therapists sitting during the session. It's it's sort of you could say it's like non-directive um, therapy. It's really allowing the person's mind to open up as it does. With MDMA, there can be some interaction, like you can see on the Trip of Compassion documentary. At times, the person is quite lucid and with you. But at other times, they're really just in their own mind. Um, and that tends to be more frequent with psilocybin. So there's in the actual therapy sessions, the medicinal sessions, there's non-directive 
um, therapy or really no therapy, You're just really sitting with the person, ensuring that they're safe. Um, there are some somatic things in the body that can come up, which, which can be dealt with as well. But in general, uh, it's non-directive. The person Sorry, was there a question? I noticed this, are there any negative side effects of taking psilocybin, but there really isn't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're very, very safe. It's, it's, it's great. They're, in fact, classic psychedelics are probably the safest psychoactive compounds we know. They're safer in terms of toxicity. They're much safer than the medicines we prescribe, uh, antidepressants, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers. They're really quite safe. That, that's not to say that there are never side effects there are, you know, people can get side effects because they can get quite tense during the sessions and jaw can hurt and a headache, but they're generally really well tolerated. And the last question, has there been any research specifically on anxiety? Yes, with good results. Uh, yeah. <laughs> nice, promising. Um, thank you so much. I think Yossi just wanted to end off with the final. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for the question a little bit earlier about um, recreational versus taking yourself as, as therapy. And what Tanya said is interesting how it could be used perhaps in religions historically, it may have been used. And I want to point out something interesting, which was back in the 60s when there was a lot of talk about LSD. Um, the Lubavitcher Rebbe was asked about LSD and how he thought it fit into the spiritual side of things and one's relationship with God. And he, in a letter, expressed that he didn't feel that it was appropriate in spiritual endeavors because he thought that we're supposed to deal with things in the, the regular mode of existence. But of course, um, in a medicinal way, as part of therapy, I could imagine, and we have to see where this is going to go, that there may be such a distinction. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly an enormous amount of interest in this from the Jewish community. I mean, if you look at a number of the researchers, leading researchers in the world, they are Jewish. Um, for example, Rick Doblin, who's the founder of MAPS, is Jewish. Um, and, the, and there's many, many others. And um, so I think there's... Yeah, there's definitely strong links between these medicines and the Jewish community. And of course, Ramdas, um, you know, Richard Alpert, um, who was one of the, the founding fathers, really, of the psychedelics movement, he, of course, was Jewish as well. And um, initially, you know, initially was, you know, very um, committed to, to that faith. And so it'd be very interesting. And I think this is why it's very interesting that um, the rabbi in, uh, the US that uh, Ilan mentioned before, Zach Kamenetz, is really starting to lead some work in this space as well around the links between Judaism and psychedelics. So it's going to be very interesting. There, there is also a very interesting connection, Tanya. I can't remember this guy's name, so jump in if you can remember. Sure. But there's the, the leading DMT researcher who's been doing DMT for decades and has written books on DMT. Oh, yes, I know who you mean, Stross, Stress, Stressman, Rick Stressman. Yes, so he's written books. Um, he's, of course, happens to be Jewish. Um, he, I've listened to some podcasts of his, and, yeah. you know, I can't vouch for his ideas, or but, but it's just very interesting that he says that, you know, he went through a phase of Buddhism and all these different spiritualities, and he was trying to conceptualise the experiences that his patients had on DMT, because particularly DMT, people often have experiences with beings and they often describe seeing things like angels and the only model that he um, that he found that fit in with his patients experiences was the prophetic model um, from the Torah so you know for what it's worth it's an interesting connection yeah it, it is definitely a whole other conversation um definitely worth exploring for sure um i want to thank you guys ellie and tanya you've done a fantastic job presenting this and bringing this to light for all of us um, and summarizing the science in a really engaging way i think uh, it's, it's a really exciting area of research and uh, we thank you for bringing that to us tonight 
Um, before everyone goes, I just do quickly want to share my screen to show you um, our upcoming business mentorship event, uh, which is here. Hopefully you can see it now. I'll just get this out of the way. Um, so yes, again, as I said in the beginning, it's called Shifting Sands and it's about exploring the economy, property markets and changing patterns of work and employment in 22 and beyond. And we have a fantastic uh, panel of speakers, Anita Zimmer, Scott Keck, Tracy McNaughton and the panel moderator will be Farrell Meltzer. Um, and along with that, as I said in the beginning, we've got our upcoming uh, social gathering in the park, Pitt is in the park, stay tuned for that, it's the Sunday after this. Um, as well as our new collaboration with Seacare. You can find this all out on our website, yjp.org.au. And I'll just finish off with thanking the YJP team. Thank you, Yossi, Dina and Moishi Khan and Brian Berger for um, helping put together tonight's event. Brian for streaming it live on Facebook and all the um, technical behind the scenes. And thank you to Mind Medicine Australia, to Ellie and to Tanya and Ilan. Um, and the rest of the team at Mind Medicine Australia. This has been fantastic, um, educational, insightful. We really enjoyed it. Um, I'm sure that Tanya and Ellie don't mind staying on for longer if anyone continues to have questions. <laughs> um, but yeah, that concludes the formal part of tonight. So I, it looks like Dion still has a question, but if anyone would like to leave or stay, uh, that's absolutely fine. Thanks everyone. It's nice to see you all and have a good night. Well, thanks so much, Ricky and Yossi and all of the team, Brian and everyone and Moshe. I just wanted to say too that um, we will be sending out a, a thank you note, which has links to our presentation and a whole lot of other ways to engage. Uh, tomorrow, Ilan will send something through and uh, we really hope to stay in touch with you all and connect with you further going forwards. And Dion, you had a question? Does this, my, um, some of my clients and uh, have got uh, PTSD and some of them in particular have got this thing called cavernous cerebral hemangioma, which is like birthmarks on your brain. Oh. And they can affect balance. Um, and, all, uh, and sometimes they will break away and then cause other issues with vision and so on. Is this something far beyond this, or is it something that, that this will work with? Mm. The, the, the issue with things like uh, MDMA, uh, that you can get uh, elevations in blood pressure. They're not particularly great elevations in blood pressure. People um, compare it to going for a jog. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because um, a lot of my clients that have had like extreme trauma in their, um, in their lives and I do other things that aren't uh, drug related, they're using your mind because your mind's really powerful. So have you explored this as far as the placebo and the non-sebo effect? Well, placebo is tricky with psychedelics because they're so powerful um, that it's difficult to control mm. these studies. You know, you can't, you, you know, obviously you kind of know if you've had the psychedelic or not. And the therapists also usually know if you've had the psychedelic or not. Right. It, it, it's been used as a criticism against psychedelics that you can't control the studies properly. But that's probably a criticism more of the science than of the medicine because it, it's difficult. They, there are randomized controlled double blinded studies, but it tends to be that if you ask the participants and the therapists, it's not, you know, quite commonly they can guess who had the psychedelic and who didn't. So by their nature, they're hard to control with placebo, these, these medicines. Because one client in particular comes to mind, he's uh, 29. He has these hemangiomas on the brain. Some of them have bled uh, and he has seizures from it. Yeah, so I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rush in, you know, where, yeah, I mean, there are lists of contraindications and, and things like that, so. Dion, have, yeah, a, have a further look at our website, you'll see there's an amazing learn section on there, and you'll, and just have a look at that and feel free to reach out with any questions. Yeah, cool, thank you very much.
Um, I actually do have a question, but again, like this is complete, like anyone can leave. I'm just curious about this. Um, you said that there were no side effects, but it feels like, I mean, just from what I've read, like there are some people who have bad trips and I know set and setting is important and you can like kind of minimize that as much as possible. But um, as in, it's not, there's no such thing as 100% effective, right? So for the people who are not getting benefit out of it, um, do you think that there needs to be more research into like, maybe finding the genetic or other biological or social factors or whatever that might predict who will respond well and who will not respond well and then possibly making it available only to those people just in case things can go wrong if that makes sense yes i guess to to make a distinction though between i guess things going wrong and not being effective um there's a raft of reasons why it might not be effective including that maybe you need more than three or four sessions. Mm. Um, at the moment, you know, if you compare it to traditional medications that people take hundreds and hundreds of times in their life, um, you know, we're talking about the, the studies that have been done generally are three, two, three or four sessions. So it could be that some people need six sessions, or as you're saying, there could be other reasons. I mean, we don't know. In fact, the trial that I'm um, hopefully, in, you know, that I'm being involved in, in, in Melbourne uh, coming up for PTSD and MDMA. One of the exploratory things we want to do in the trial is to really have a good look at the people who um, don't respond and sort of what, what, what you're saying, like, why don't, why do certain people not respond? I um, mean, it's a fascinating question and we don't really have great answers, I think, at the moment. And just to your question, just, if you don't mind. Just, just hold on a moment, Dion. Um, just Ricky, just to answer your question. So just about bad trips. I just want to just, just say, want to that say that in general, general most of the most researchers of the and doctors research. who work with these medicines say, and Dion, could you put that just on mute, please? Because I think it's causing an echo. Thank you. Um, that a bad trip is actually, you know, you, you, again, the medicine gives you what you need or not what you want, right? So if there are dark parts in your experience and there are parts of it that are challenging and so on, that's actually beneficial because that allows you to come face to face with some of what you might have been avoiding uh, through your life or defending from and so on. So in actual fact, you can have elements in a trip that might be appear to be bad and dark, but in general, they will resolve and you'll come face to face with what most frightens you and you'll go straight to it and most of the researchers and doctors say you just go towards what looks really bad what looks frightening and when you go towards it it like disappears and you realize it was not so scary to begin with so yeah that's an interesting way of looking at it um but i guess like i mean it's just unclear to me in terms of is it a cumulative effect like if someone's having three sessions and then ellie you're saying perhaps they need six does one session build on the previous like if it's supposed to be really potent and you face your fears or you face whatever's underlying um why would necessarily the next session be the session that it's gonna kick in if that makes sense yeah i mean i i can just speak from my experience doing you know treatment i guess therapy with people that have had severe trauma you know i've done therapy with people for years every week that have had trauma twice a week for years it just takes a long time to peel back the layers. Um, you know, trauma is deep and, and powerful and painful and scary. Um, you know, I think people work through trauma in a stepwise, well, I mean, it's messy, you know, but, but it is kind of stepwise, you know, you, you sort of go deeper and deeper into the trauma, into the emotions. Um, so it takes time. I think, so I think to answer your question, I think it's the same reason that therapy takes time. Um, it doesn't all come out at once. We'd probably all become psychotic if all our traumas came out at once. And, you know, so the mind protects us and it will let out what it needs to let out, what it can let out at a particular time. And it will take as much time as it needs. You know, I think the mind is very good at protecting us and, and giving us what we can take. It reminds me of, you know, like it says, Hashem will only give you what you can cope with. I think the mind, that's how the mind works um, often in, in therapy that, you know, st stuff comes up and you, you process it and then more stuff comes up and you process it. 
Yeah, that makes sense. I guess it's just you, you got to chip away at it. Um, and yeah, you don't know when you're going to hit what needs to be hit, I guess. Yeah. Cool stuff. Um, it looks like Ilan's got to actually wrap up. Yeah, yeah so, I do too. Yeah, thank you so much. We've gone over time. This has been great. Um, I could go on for a lot longer, but I know everyone has to go. So thank you all. This has been fantastic. Have a good night and we'll see you at future events. Please God. And um, Yossi and Ricky, if you can just come back to me on that other thing, because I, I feel bad because it was a private no, absolutely. message. And, yeah, yeah we'll thank be, you. sure. No problems. Thank Thanks you. Everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye.